Hi, I'm Dan Curry, and this is the Shuttlepod Show. I think you said to me, yeah, I could kill you with this piece of paper. <laughs> and I looked around. If any, is anybody hearing this? <laughs> well, there's a way you can do that, actually. <laughs> if you snap it at just the right moment, then it's best to practice on papayas because they have about the same uh, tensile strength as human epithelial tissue. Ooh. And if you snap it at the right moment and come in at the right angle, it'll nope. go about halfway into a papaya. <laughs> don't want to give him any paper. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, no paper I, I, for this man. Well, I don't know if you remember this, but you know, there's nothing like reaching out to the rib cage and squeezing the spleen. Oh, Lord. <laughs> wow. Uh, right? Where do you learn that? Didn't know you could do that. Uh, I didn't know that was legal. Gonna go and do my convention thing. Got my costume, I'm going now. Hi, everyone. Welcome to another episode of The Shuttle Pod Show. Today, we have very special guest, Dan Curry. We'll be answering your fan questions, doing some Star Trek trivia, finding ourselves on Connor's remote island, and much more. As always, our Patreon members get a full extended version of this episode. I'm Erica LaRose, but before we move on, we have a special message from Andrew Robinson. Like, subscribe, and join us on Patreon. Ah, oh, uh, thanks, Sandy. 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 <laughs> you keep telling him, sir. That's right. Never let up. Nope. <laughs> and now for your hosts, Connor Trenier and Dominic Heating. Hey, hey, hey. We're a little hey. bit. Uh, and I love. Yeah. We're How's a little bit going? overdone. Well, you nice know, little, see you back nice from, see uh, you. from Vegas. We're a bit overdone. We're a yes. bit overdone, aren't we? Yeah. That was my first convention, and wow. Yeah. Wow. Is, Welcome wow. to the circus. I'm yeah. going to carry a bunch of Starbucks with me next time. Um, <laughs> yeah. Little cans. Right. What a trip, huh? It's, yeah. uh, it's yeah. a hell of a week. And it was really fun to have, you know, our own presence there, which yeah. was uh, extraordinary. It felt like the undercurrent of the whole kind of convention it? was uh, it, yeah. Yeah. our show. I mean, that's no sort of how it felt to me. It was really nice to get feedback from you guys about um, your panel and how a lot of people were on the Sunday morning yeah. talking oh, yeah. about Shuttle Pod Show. Yeah. Yeah. God bless. Yeah. So cool. Yeah. And to have all the Patreon members there, the family, mm-hmm. and to spend time with them. And thank you guys. It was so yeah. nice. Thank, you. thank you guys. We thank filled you. that bar. Yeah. We yeah. filled the eye yeah. bar. Yep. Yeah. yeah. We, we put uh, all faces the Patreon, to names. So yeah. Cool. We we had a toast for all of the Patreon members who managed to make uh, the the convention. Yeah. And it was amazing how many there were a lot were. of you. Oh my heavens. Yeah. Thank you. It was Thank extraordinary so the difference between last year and this year yeah, you guys in, were in terms of recognition for the show. Mm-hmm. Night and day. I mean, last year, a few people here and there had heard of us. And yeah. There were little sort of encampments in our panel room, as it were, going, yeah, we know you. So and this year, the room was full. Yeah. And I mean, full. There must have been a thousand people out there. Wow. About 600 to a thousand. And everybody knew about Shuttle Point Show, so complex. It was awesome. Thank you. Thank you, guys. Well, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, Treks and Trekkers, welcome back to the Shuttle Pod. I'm here with my co host, Connor Trenier and Erica LaRose. We are delighted to have in the chair, the Golden Throne this week, a man whose handprint is just over every corner of this franchise. Uh, he has been described by the Akudas as a veritable genius. And uh, that doesn't uh, that doesn't over, oversell it. Um, he is truly a Renaissance man. He's a fine artist. He's a, a writer. He is a visual special effects genius and supervisor producer. Uh, he is and a mystery man. And a mystery man. He, <laughs> he, he truly there, there. There is his interests are as broad as his talent is, and uh, it's just an absolute. Delight to invite and uh, introduce you to Mr. Dan Curry. Yes. Woo. Thank you, Dan. Thank you for being here. Well, I also, I just want to hey. add really quickly, we want to say again, we're here at the Matrix. Oh, yes. we are. Uh, as guests of Rogue Machine Theater, thank who you, are Rogue. residents here. Thank you, guys. And thank you as always. Um, and uh, on we go. So, Dan, welcome to uh, the Shuttle Pod. Well, thanks for inviting me. Yeah, it's it's a, truly an honor. to be here. Uh, you're still working, aren't you? I am. God bless you. What did you tell me you were? We were chatting before we came on. Yeah, I'm working with uh, partners in uh, Australia and uh, London, uh, developing an original science fiction series uh, set in the asteroid belt. All right. Wow. Does this have a title yet, or is that uh, under wraps? Uh, no, the title is Space Rush. Space Rush. And it kind of emulates the uh, oh, gold rush in right. California, yeah. right. although they're people are going out to get rich quick in the asteroid belt, and of course it presents this opportunities for people for me to, in be, that uh, show. to misbehave. <laughs> 
I feel like we're kind of there right now. Uh, it's a bit of a gold rush to get people out there, you know, at least, you know, the mile up just at the atmosphere with SpaceX yeah. and, and all that kind of stuff. Yeah, no um, kidding. Apparently, at least it seems that going up is uh, safer than going down. <laughs> <laughs> Generally the case. <laughs> yeah. So how did you get involved with these guys in Australia and in England? Um, I, uh, my son and I had developed the show uh, a few years ago, and we wound up, for other reasons, putting it aside for a while. And uh, this uh, writer, uh, Linda Foti in uh, Australia, uh, ran across our, our project and contacted us and said, let's get going and brought in another writer, um, Alexa Wyatt. And uh, so we've been working on that. And I did about 100 illustrations of different concepts. Had you written it. a treatment? Had you, you yes. and your boy had written the treatment? Yes. Remind me of your son's name. I've forgotten. Devin. Devin, that's right. And he's living in London right now. Right, he you is. Told me. Yeah. So you've written the treatment. Did you write a script at all? Or? Uh, no, we're working on that now. And you, you guys are actually sitting down to write that yourselves? Yeah, and uh, thanks to modern technology, our Zoom meetings allowed that to happen. Right. Good for you. Mm-hmm. It's good to do it. Well, let's, uh, let's go back to something of the beginning. So, I read on Wikipedia. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I just want to get that out there. Uh, okay. Great. Where are it's you from? It's an inside joke. Actually, I, I read it on, uh, on Alpha. Uh, Alpha... Uh, Alpha. And yeah, uh, memory yeah. Alpha, yeah. yeah. I've been reading a lot of Memory Alpha lately, which is the science, the Star Trek sort of encyclopedia. Um, so you start out life, uh, you, live, you were born in New York. That's correct. Right? And you got a fascination with uh, cinema at an early age. Right. Forbidden yeah. Planet. And yeah. Ray Harryhausen just opened up. I uh, remember seeing Forbidden Planet and realizing that you could combine live actors paintings, animation, and models to create a new cinematic reality. And I said, yeah. that would be fun to do. And that's- so you go home and you you persuade your brother to be in your movie. Uh, I did. Were, and, uh, and you create the, 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 the rear projection backdrop in a cardboard box and tracing paper. Yeah. And, How about uh, that? We had seen uh, The Beast from 20,000 Fathoms. Uh, Ray Harryhausen uh, did the visual effects for it. And uh, I read an article about how he did it. And I had this broken 8 millimeter uh, projector and shot movies of my brother running around screaming and then made toy dinosaurs just sniffling <laughs> move around in front of them. It was really fun. Did you, what does your brother do now? Did he get into the... He's retired now, but he ran Ohio State Medical School for many years. He's oh. a neuroendocrinologist. So no slouch. The curries right. are not slouches. Yeah, I mean, we're, uh, and we're the first members of our family to get through grammar school. Okay. Really? Wow. Yeah. Are you That's second amazing. generation? Yeah, yeah well, uh, my uh, parents are, were I, Irish uh, Americans, and... Uh, they were children of the Depression and had to drop out of school and work full time when they were in the fifth grade. And wow. uh, uh, that's our family study. But they were, uh, we grew up in a house filled with books and uh, they stressed the value of education. And, uh, and uh, one of the things I learned from them is that the most valuable things in life are those things that have no physical value. And that's your integrity and your knowledge, neither of those can be stolen from you. Kidding. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No kidding. And education yeah. and uh, your, the, your your word is your bond. Yeah, yeah no kidding. And books. And books. books. Just have books in the home. Yeah. Yeah. That's all that matters. Yeah. yeah. It, it's true. And if you come to our home, you'll see it's kind of wall to wall. Yeah, there was a study, uh, I think, done in the 50s or 60s. I think it was in Harlem or the Bronx, where uh, they it was a, a long study, like 10 years, and they were trying to figure out what makes... Um, are there uh, exterior elements that that make people successful or not successful, mm-hmm. regardless of your environment? And it was two things. One, it was no corporal punishment. Mm. And two, just have books in your home. Wow. Yeah. Whether or not you read them. If they're there, someone's going to pick it up and crack it open mm. and find a new world and find, you know, access to their imagination. And, yeah, uh, yeah. My mom was really good at reading to me, and uh, from an early age, she was a va- avid reader. Um, so you you decide early on you want to be an artist, and you you go to uh, college in Vermont to right. do fine arts, right? Uh, was it Mul- Middlebury? Middlebury yeah. College Middlebury, in Vermont. Yeah. Middlebury, Vermont. <laughs> <laughs> Just had our fifty fifth class reunion, and you went that right. Yeah. Oh wow! Wow. Uh, wow. So, and everyone's still alive and kicking? Uh, well, those had shown up. 
couple of cards sent from families. <laughs> so then you, you 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 graduate from there. Do you go straight to Humboldt? No. Uh, uh, after Middlebury, um, there was a conflict going on in Southeast Asia, and uh, I was uh, excited to serve, but I volunteered for the Peace Corps. That's right. And uh, why the Peace Corps? Well, it was a way to serve the country, and uh, and. Uh, but I didn't want to serve in a way that required taking the lives of other people. Right. Are you a so, CO? Huh? Are you a CO? N no, yeah. uh, uh, just Peace Corps was an alternate service. Right. And so um, I... Uh, this was a way to, to not go to Vietnam or... Yeah, but with poetic justice. With they sent me right justice. to the banks of the Mekong River. Right. right. And, right. and uh, so I did small dams and bridges in uh, rural villages. That's right. And what... The, the deal was uh, we got amazing uh, language training and technical training in Hawaii. And after th three months, I was able to get around in Thai, which is a really unusual language uh, by Western standards. Right. And uh, so the, if every village that wanted a project, they would apply to the government. And if approved, the government would provide building materials. I would provide... Uh, I'd go survey the site and design the structure, get it approved by a government engineer, and then supervising supervise the construction of it, and the villagers would provide the labor. Strong, and then right. during the uh, rainy season where they were busy with the rice, rice cycle, then I taught at Konken University uh, architectural drafting. Amazing. Wow. I mean, so awesome. this is right in the middle of the war. Yeah. And, I mean, I would imagine if you build something, someone wants to not have that built. Well, uh, the the Mekong River was a pretty significant dividing line. Uh, it, all the war was on the other side, and Thailand was, uh, there was no active combat in Thailand. Right. Mm -hmm. right. So how long did it take you to learn Thai? Um, I'm still learning. Uh, you uh, speak at home uh, with your uh, wife, don't you? It, did it you was, meet at that time? Is that, yeah, is that, yeah, but that's when we met. And uh, uh, we speak Thai at home, so I don't lose the language. And I was able to get around... Uh, reasonably well after a few months because of the quality of their our language training. And what the Peace Corps did that was interesting is you would take a, uh, an abstract language test and depending on how you did it on it, they would determine if you didn't do well, they'd send you to uh, uh, a place that spoke Spanish, for example. Mm -hmm. But if you did well, then they'd send you to things where the languages were more challenging. Mm -hmm. right. And you had picked up Lao as well. Is that uh, Lao, well, yeah. uh, with normal government efficiency, they trained us in Central Thai and sent me to an area where everybody spoke Lao. Right. And not unlike the Romance languages in Europe, Sanskrit's the base for, for most for of all the those languages, languages in right. Southeast yeah. Asia. Yeah. Um, so, and then what a very career you had while you were out there. So you, you end up making a TV show in Thailand. Yeah. Uh, My Tree and the Magic Chopsticks. That's, yeah. oh, wow. Yeah, it's amazing <laughs> you know that, yeah. And it was for the de Department of Education. <laughs> Sorry, just, just got a thump in one time. Wow, that's... Uh, I knew I'm that. I'm so impressed you knew Too that. Uh, and oh it was uh, this about uh, this itinerary, itinerant um, uh, magician who would go around and he had these magic chopsticks and he could pull words out of books and stuff. And it gave us the excuse to do little documentaries like Wild Elephant Training. And uh, then I was able to build an animation stand and did all the animation with paper cutouts. How do you go from building bridges and on a small scale to getting into a Thai TV studio? I, mean, I made it up as I went along. No kidding. <laughs> I mean, this man has had pretty much every job. Pretty much. You can... You can think of under the sun. Yeah, you've quite uh, the range. For you sure. designed a, a library in, on a small island in the Gulf of Siam. I read. I did for wow. the United How States. How on earth do you get that gig? Uh, somebody asked me if I was interested in doing it, and uh, <laughs> then one of my favorite projects was I got to design uh, the N N nightclub in the Montian International Hotel, and they gave me. Uh, a team of carpenters and said, do whatever you want. So I did all these things that were kind of like, I didn't know what they were at the time, but like polygons running all over the surface with a lot of whimsically uh, erotic uh, murals on the wall that were uh, in keeping with the interests of their clientele. Um, I think I bet that. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, but you, you never had a moment where you thought, mm, maybe I'll go design clubs. You Because you, uh, you'd gone there having made small films and, and yeah it just fell into uh, fell into it did you always know what you wanted to get into no uh, no you just sort it of just went with it stumbled from one 
bad decision to another. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you end up running the Royal Ball for the King. Uh, well, production designer production for the Royal design. Ball. Yeah. And I, this one really blew me away. Production designer for the Bangkok Opera. Yeah, and we did productions like the Magic Flute. How and cool is that? That was great. That that good time. Been. So how long were you out there at that period? Five years. Five, a good stint. So then you come back to the U.S., and your first job is as a biomedical designer. But hang on. How the hell I, 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 that I want to back up for a second. <laughs> so one of the first times I met you on set, Dan yeah. would come down often, you know, if, and if we had time to chat, and uh, we would, and uh, clearly a, a fascinating human being. And one of the first times we were chatting, I think I was holding a script or something, and you were talking about some of the things that you uh, went through or did Um out there in, in Southeast Asia. And, and I think you said to me, yeah, I could kill you with this piece of paper. Oh, yeah. <laughs> and I looked around, if any, is anybody hearing this? <laughs> <laughs> well, there's a way Am you I can alone? do that actually. <laughs> but if you snap it at just the right moment, then it's best to practice on papayas because they have about the same uh, tensile strength as human epithelial tissue. Ooh. And if you snap it at the right moment and come in at the right angle, it'll nope. go about halfway <laughs> into a papaya. Don't want anyone to give him any paper. <laughs> exactly. <yeah. laughs> well, no paper I, I, for this man. Well, I don't know if you remember this, but uh, the very first day of shooting, you and Scott Bakula, Captain Archer, were going to be flying under the Enterprise and you were in some mm -hmm. little pod. Yeah. And Scott asked me to, uh, well, where are we going to be? And because they had hadn't seen images of the ship yet. So I took two paper plates, taped them together, took a piece of foam core and cut out the back end with the two twin nacelles and folded them up and said, well, you guys will be flying under here. <laughs> <laughs> now you're famous for this stuff, aren't you? I mean, a lot of the, uh, the um, alien spaceships on next gen, you made up out of shampoo bottles and, and razor handles. and Yeah, we had a light, uh, thin budget at the time. Incredible. So. I mean, just incredible. I mean, one was, wasn't it your son's robot foot? Yeah, it was a broken robot toy. Unbelievable. And, uh, and I stuck uh, uh, throwaway razor handles on the side as if they were little nacelles. And then... Uh, my uh, colleague Gary Hutzel put little lights inside, and that was seen the picture what? in the book. Where's your? Uh, just pr let's preview your book real quick. Here you go. Let me so show cool. this to the audience. This is the artistry of Dan Curry, Ooh. and it's a really fantastic coffee book. And uh, where, where can the where can where can they go and get this? Uh, well, Amazon, and uh, you can order through any bookstore. God bless. Well, have a good look at that. I've had a good leaf through this this morning, and it really is. It's a it's a beautiful book. It's extraordinary. And, um, and co-written by uh, Ben. Ben John Ben Robinson. Ben Robinson. Thank you for helping me out with that. So um, wait, you, you you come back from your experience in Southeast Asia and you think, hmm, what? Uh, Got to find a job. Um, <laughs> well, yeah, and the first job was a proper job, wasn't it? Yeah, biomedical uh, illustrator. Yeah, and it it was interesting. What the hell is that when it's well? Home? Normally, you need special training, but I same thing. I faked it and did some sketches for them. And they said, okay. And I wound up designing surgery textbooks. And um, and I it was like being in school. You'd sit in this room with rows of artists and you would draw all day. And if you seemed like you were talking too much, they would... Uh, the art director would tap on the window in the front of the room and uh, we were subjected to listening to AM Top 40 radio all day. So uh, <laughs> one of my colleagues dumped coffee in the radio. <laughs> oh so God. that didn't happen anymore. <laughs> and, um, was that where, which, where were you, in LA now? Uh, no, that was in uh, Massapequa Mass uh, on Long Island. Is, you know, and, New, then, England? New England. Oh. And then there was a... Uh, I'm sorry, Long Island or New England? Uh, Long Island, Long Island. Massapequa. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so then uh, uh, I met somebody who was a department chairman at a community college on Cape Cod who liked my work and said, hey, would you be interested in teaching art up here? And I said, yeah. Mm -hmm. And I was really tired of uh, biomedical illustration. And uh, so uh, I taught um, drawing, painting, graphic design, and uh uh, mixed media. At a college? Arts, there? A, a community college, community Cape Cod Community How old college. are you at this time? Uh, about 22, 23. What? Wow. Yeah. wow, you're young. Just a band. <laughs> How old were you when you went to uh, Southeast Asia? 19. Good right. God. 
What was your undergraduate degree in specifically? Uh, fine arts major, theater minor. Oh, okay. Wow. So you did some plays? Yeah, lots of plays. Oh, and cool. um, and I had a fabulous production design teacher, Chandler Potter, who taught me how to uh, do accurate perspective renderings in the system developed by Albrecht Durer in the 1400s. Oh. And then when I came to Hollywood, um, one of the old masters here taught me how to do that with any lens just by calculating its angle of divergence. You're a big, you're a, you're a huge uh, fan, if that's the right word, or certainly an expert in uh, in proportion, aren't you? And and, yeah, perspective, perspective, yeah, perspective. Yeah, just fascinated yeah, by yeah. it. Yeah, that's uh, that really caught your imagination early on, didn't it? So, at what point do you? So, you're, you're back home, and you then do you decide to go to Humboldt to go and do a, a, fi, a, a formal fine arts degree? Yeah, yeah. One of my colleagues at uh, Cape Cod Community College knew the department chairman at Humboldt State, uh, now uh, Cal Poly Humboldt, and. Uh, was they, Humboldt Humboldt then? You know, Humboldt State on. University. And so they uh, they communicated without my knowledge. And so finally I got an offer from Humboldt State. Uh, I, they, I could write my own graduate program. They would pay me to go. And uh, I just have to teach two courses per semester. Wow. And so I was able to do a, uh, a program in both film and theater and do a lot of live theater where I could write, direct, and design plays and uh, and then do uh, student films. And I read one of your wow. quotes. You said that anyone that wants to get into this business should do at least one live theater production. Absolutely. And have that experience. Absolutely. I, I, I fully concur. Yeah. I concur. We concur. Yes. So. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I, yeah. I, and even if um, uh, you have no interest in doing live theater, again, just to see how a production works. And in live theater, you have time to watch the cast evolve yes. a, a character and, yeah. and find the truth in what's going on. Yeah. And see the different the animals. Yeah, and see the company deepen as a whole. Yeah. And uh, and see it build each night from each production night. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, uh, totally you're at sure. Humboldt, and I know this is when Marsha Lucas spots some of your artwork. Yeah, the, the university it had a... George's wife. Yeah. Oh, yes, I know. Yeah. They, yeah. Had a pro <laughs> uh, they had a program where they would just do pop-up one one person shows in, in unused rooms, and... Uh, I had applied to the students and uh, the, who ran the program and, and got a one-man show. And uh, Marsha had come up to, she had just finished editing Taxi Driver and had come up to do a uh, program on film editing. And she happened to walk by that, um, uh, that exhibit and mm -hmm. saw some paintings and came and found me and said, would you be interested in matte painting? And I said, what's that? And uh, then uh, she was kind enough to introduce me to the great Dennis Muren, right. one of the giants of visual effects, visual effects. and uh, yeah. Alan Maley, Mike Pangrazio, people at Industrial Light and Magic. And uh, that got me started. And then I wanted to get my degrees and, and finish teaching the courses I was. So they recommended me to Universal and uh, Universal hired me to do matte paintings and design alien architecture Buck for Rogers. Um, Buck Rogers oh, and the original Battlestar Galactica. Right. And that's where I learned uh, about motion control photography. And um, so that brought you to you, LA. You'd also said that you early on naturally sort of storyboarded things. Yeah. I would, uh, when I was a boy, I would do storyboards of movies. Uh, that were just imaginary. I didn't know what storyboards were, but I, I did them. Right. <laughs> and uh, also I remember seeing Spartacus and uh, mm -hmm. uh, seeing the title sequence, and uh, which was basically statues and their unusual lighting and the last statue breaks. And I had this epiphany of the power of a, uh, uh, of a title sequence and how it's like the... Um, the overture for an opera, it, it yes. gets the audience ready to see the right. movie that follows. And so that was part of my career. I did a lot of title sequences. Yeah, there's no better illustration of that than your work for Rodney Dangerfield's fi film, of all things, Back to School. Yeah, that was... And that title sequence is quite delightful. That was fun. The, the director wanted to do a biography of Rodney's character from age 12 to 55, and by a fluke, the neighborhood I grew up in was the neighborhood where Rodney's character was supposed to have grown up in. So I took, uh, re-photographed some uh, images from our family album 
And there was no Photoshop then. So I would do photo real oil paintings of Rodney's face over my father's yeah. face and put tall and fat signs on the door. Well, all those photos in that montage, were they all from your home, from your personal? Uh, most of them. There were, there were some, a couple of stock photos. A couple photos. of stocks, yeah. But no, I mean, I, and you can definitely see where he's got, there's your dad sitting on the beach, clearly, looking up to yeah, take and, the shot. And there's and one where he's got Rodney's face <laughs> splattered on him. And there's one where he's holding, uh, Rodney's holding a, a baby and he's got a fedora on and that's my father uh, and the baby is my older brother. Oh, oh that's great. Oh, that and you came up in just, there was a golden age, Hitchcock's guy who did, title sequences. Right. Um, he, I took a class in film in college and a whole section of it was on title sequences. And, uh, you know, for a long time, it was just, you know, a portrait and it wasn't telling part of the story. And then it becomes some, it becomes the story or an element of the story, a hint, a tone of the thing you're about to see. Right. And has a real psychological element to- Yeah, like North by Northwest yes. is a great example. Right. Yeah. Saul Did you, Bass. Saul Bass. Saul yeah. Bass. Saul Bass. Was well he- Someone who you looked up to, or did you have oh, heroes yeah, uh, in that? Yeah, well, I, I I didn't quite know to read the credits when I was little, but I became uh, a great respect for Saul Bass, a, a true giant in, yeah. in graphic design, not just for movies, but for other industries. Mm -hmm. right. right. So he went on to do the main titles for, let's get into Star Trek. You did The Voyage Home, which was Star right. Trek four. 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 And seven, what was that one? Uh, 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 TNG thing, uh, First Contact. You did First Contact, that's and right. Voyager and Deep Space Nine. Right, and then you did both the uh, both the Deep Space Nine. I watched those last night. They up, they up, they up the ante in the Deep Space Nine one. What was that about? When they, it was a bit more sort of. Well, the know. the theme in the original version was uh, we're alone out there. Right, and uh, then uh, as. The show evolved and different things took place. Then it became, and now it's a hub of activity. Right. So um, Dennis McCarthy re-recorded the theme, but made it a little bit more a little upbeat. Jazzier. And I, they didn't get the tambourine like we did. But <laughs> 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 and we were, they were spared the tambourine. And we made some new shots. And, and so... Uh, Right, it was, it was and, the, but the, and the credits for Voyager are fantastic, mate. They really well, are. It, it, that was a team effort. There were a lot of people that, uh, involved with that. And you're still using models at this point. Well, and the Voyager title sequence was a hybrid. There were some CG, uh, uh, some... The solar flares were, were CG, were they? And uh, The solar flares were a mixture of CG and... Um, a baking soda thrown up and shot at high speed. Shut the front yeah, door. yeah. We had Ron Moore on, and he mm -hmm. talked about some of the things you guys were coming up with. It was like, what are you oh, talking about? The dog yeah. shit planet. So cool. yeah, the dog yeah. shit planet. Hashtag dog shit planet. Oh yeah, that was great. Yeah, that was Ron Moore uh, trying to make a uh, turn a bad situation into good. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, we were we had a. Uh, an episode requiring a brown mottled mining planet, and at the time we had. Uh, something Neolithic by today's standards called the Sony System G that could take a flat image and wrap it around uh, uh, a partial sphere. So I kept looking at NASA photographs and paintings and macro shots of rocks in my garden and I didn't like anything. So Ron went in the back room and threaded up a piece of negative on the machine. And I looked at it and said, yeah, that's good. We put a little weather system over the top. It'll be great. And I said, what is that? And Ron said, can't tell you. So no, what is that? No. So I asked the editor to unwrap it. And you know, if you took um, toothpaste and put your hand on it and pulled it up, you'd get little spiky formations. Right. So I saw those and began to discern kernels of undigested corn. And the, oh, the no. ultimate giveaway was the Nike logo from his sneaker. Oh. And, <laughs> and we used that as a... Uh, Planet in Seven Episodes, nicknamed Ficus Canis. And, <laughs> oh, my gosh. And then uh, a follow-up to that story, Canis. we, were, we mm. were at a production meeting, and uh, uh, <laughs> the director of the episode required, the episode required a new uh, rift in time-space continuum, and the director said, Dan, how are you going to do that? And I started to answer it, and our executive producer, Rick Berman, said, don't tell us. Don't tell anyone. <laughs> and everybody at the table <laughs> laughed, and I had no idea what was going on. So Rick says, I guess you haven't seen this. So he slides a copy of TV Guide over to me. I open it up, and there's my picture, and that's the story. <laughs> Hilarious. Fantastic. That's awesome. Oh so how did you find your way into Star Trek? 
Um, I had been working at uh, Modern Film Effects after Universal and then worked, moved to Cinema Research. And we did a lot of work for Paramount. And Peter Lauritsen, who was our right. uh, post-production supervisor, producer, uh I'd done a lot of work with him on different TV shows, and Peter called me up and said, hey, uh, we're thinking about bringing Star Trek back, and we'd like you to do uh, for storyboard for uh, stock shots of the Enterprise flying around. So I went over and met Gene, talked about what his ideas were, and showed me Andy Probert's design for the Enterprise 1701D. And so I did these storyboards, and... The idea was that they would be able to use those 40 shots for every episode. Yeah. And uh, that lasted about three days into the pilot. <laughs> yeah. And uh, they'd use them up. It was all done. Uh, and yeah. so, uh, and, well, the stories required specific yeah. shots. And so that's that's how I got into it. How was, uh, what was Gene Roddenberry like to me? He was, uh, uh, well, he was older at the time. I liked him. We had, uh, a lot of interesting philosophical conversations about colonialism and my experiences in Asia kind of mm -hmm. uh, led to some interesting discoveries. And uh, uh, and he was very uh, believed in the importance of the, the prime directive and uh, uh, that uh, reflecting upon foibles of our current society by letting the audience see things from a distance. And mm. so that... So I, I thought Gene was cool. Was he heavily involved in, in your side of... Not really. Yeah. Uh, he would just comment on it once in a while, but uh, they pretty much left us alone. And we had a, a, a two-team system, or we evolved one, uh, so that one team would be available to be on set and one team would be available to uh, be shooting motion control models or shooting or doing compositing. And so uh, uh, it, our team was myself and... Uh, Ron Moore, and then uh, Rob Legato and Gary Hutzel were the other team. All right. Um, so you, there you are working on the new Next Generation reboot. And at, at what point does do you start training the Klingon stuff at that point? How, how, how soon do you get into the? Does your martial arts training come in? And and well, then the, the the I mean the invention of these things, the the <laughs> batleth, the mechleth. The sword of Kalis. I mean, this is all Dan. I'm Curry. cleaning my nails with the uh, curve. <laughs> this right is now. all Dan Curry's work. These are yeah. These you designed all these Ow. these Klingon. Oh, oh sharp. Uh, well, I, uh, <laughs> I, uh, I think I don't mean to interrupt, but I, I think this is a great opportunity to uh, talk about uh, the fact that uh, you, Dan, were trained as a dagger fighter. Yeah. So you these uh, these designs presumably came out of your knowledge of fighting with knives. Absolutely. And how does that sort of correlate to the Peace Corps? Well, it's very pacifistic in a way. Uh, no, no. <laughs> <laughs> I don't very think so. <laughs> uh, well, when I was in the Peace Corps, I'd be assigned to different villages and I'd uh, work there for several months doing a project. And it turned out that a lot of the villages had kind of a secret martial art that they'd studied for generations and, and kept to themselves. All and, slightly different. Yeah, all slightly different. And they were kind to the clumsy foreigner who uh, had no skill whatsoever. And so they started to teach me and I learned from them. And then uh, I got introduced to different masters and I would study one thing with one master or another. And I had a, a, a dagger teacher in Laos who was uh, a master and uh, uh, he taught me the poetry of using a dagger and why you have to understand anatomy so it's not so much what you do but where you do it and uh, keeping in f uh, the changing angles of ribs so that you wouldn't get snagged if you were penetrating somebody's torso um it's <laughs> important, not, wow. important not to be snagged when you're penetrating the torso <laughs> <laughs> I've always found. <laughs> In your training. <laughs> and uh, then I got to study uh, Taekwondo with uh, a great master, Kim Myung Soo, and I studied with him for years. And uh, What's your uh, rating or what's your belt level? Uh, uh, with uh, Taekwondo, just black. Hmm. Just black. Just black. Yeah. Yeah. So Do you still out. study at all? Uh, I practice Tai Chi every morning. Uh, yeah. Still, I've done that for 50 years, and I, I usually will pick up a different weapon and work out with it just not to lose it. I mean, it. you seem to be really inspired by um, the the culture of Thailand, yeah. Laos, Southeast Asia. What, 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 what was that about for you? Well, uh, 
I, when I first got there, I was a little afraid. I didn't quite understand everything that was going on and uh, also brought the hubris of America being number one and uh, realized very quickly that that wasn't the case <laughs> and uh, that the villagers gave me so much more than I could have possibly given them. Mm. I helped them build a project, but they taught me wisdom and the knowledge of how to be in the same place and, and respect each other's psychological privacy. Mm. Yet each person in society served an important role in the village. And uh, uh, a lot of the Concepts of Buddhism were really mm -hmm. uh, fascinating and important. And um, I lived in a town called Kantken, and I lived maybe 300 yards from a wonderful old temple. And I would like to go hang out there and talk to the monks. And um, what so, part of the country is that? Is that inland somewhere? Or, yeah, it's yeah. in the northeastern right. section. Oh, lovely. Do you go back often to visit? Uh, no, and I sh we should go more, but I've been busy. But. <laughs> yeah. uh, We've been back a few times, and my wife's sister and niece have come over a few times to spend time with us. And oh, so. that's lovely. Oh, fascinating, really. Um, so uh, when do they call on you to, to, to bring your martial arts expertise to the, the Klingon fighting style and well, great it, mock bar, isn't it? The, uh... Yeah, it started with, um, we had an episode where Worf was to inherit a... Uh, a famous Klingon bladed weapon. And I'd been imagining the Batleth in my mind, but had no reason to make one. And uh, and so the art department sent down something that vaguely looked like a pirate's cutlass. And I said, yeah, we got to do better by the Klingons than that. Let's do something ergonomically sound. Even as a kid, I didn't like bogus movie weapons. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I read that, yeah. <laughs> and so I, I, I awesome. had was aware of a something called a Chinese fighting crescent, which is a, a, a little crescent about that big used one in each hand. And I said, well, I wonder if that was big and kind of used like a staff. Mm -hmm. So I made a foam core batleth, showed it to Rick Berman, and he said oh, with God. classic Rick uh, reaction, if it was two inches shorter, I'd accept it. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, oh, Rick. And, uh, and then I uh, showed it to stud coordinator Dennis Madalone, and uh, Dennis said, I can't possibly work with that. So then I showed him how to use it and that, how the decapitation flanges work and uh, how it could provide different kinds of leverage. And so th that's uh, so Dennis became an evangelist for the Batleth. Oh, really? Wow. Yeah. Amazing. That's awesome. It really is. The, the decapitation the name, flange. Where does the name come from? Uh, uh, the writers, I have no idea. Uh, that, one, that one they made up. But now you've got the, not curleth, the curleth. The curleth. With a K, which is now named after you, which uh, was, this was for Michael in the New Picard series. Right, season three. Right. Uh, and Michael uh, Michael called me up and, and said, uh, Daniel, I'd like you to look at this photograph. So he sent me a picture of a sword it's that a very was good proposed. Of him, by the way. <laughs> and, uh, it's, like, it's uncanny. It's like he was sitting there. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, they, uh, uh, so I told them what what objections I had. So as a favor, I designed. I said I'll just design one for you. So that's um, that's it. And since I did it as a favor, they made two one one for the show and one for me as a thank you. So right. cool. Do you own the copyright to these? That's it. Uh, well, there's no copyright. Is there no? Uh, I'm, I've seen online people have have been making them, and. <laughs> When, There's the original prototype for the yeah, Mechleth, right? Yeah, when Michael that. signed on to Deep Space Nine, I got another funny phone call. Daniel, I need a new weapon. <laughs> and so I came over to He's my back. house and I showed him my collection. And I, this is the front edge of a Nepalese Korra sword. I said, well, let's use that because I like the downward thing. That way, if you deflect a weapon, it'll be guided away mm -hmm. from you. And then I just made this up and Michael and I went out in the backyard and as a and precaution, I reinforced it with popsicle sticks. Because as you do. And, uh, <laughs> and then we- It was a hot summer's day. We worked out in the backyard and, and uh, Michael liked it. So we showed it to Rick and then it became uh, the Mechleth. And the wow. rule, what Michael wanted was something small enough to hide behind his back, but bad enough that an expert, an expert could take on a Batleth. Mm. 
There you and go. So that's, there it is. That's, right. And I wanted something that could be underhand, overhand, that had cutting surfaces so you could do close work with it. And you could also throw it like a, like like a, a tomahawk. Dan, like a tomahawk. Mm. Dan Curry can, in fact, kill you with a piece of paper. <laughs> <laughs> well, and that's a, actually... foot, a footnote to all of that. Uh, I think I'm right in saying the Batleth in particular, this is the only weapon to be acknowledged by the Korean Martial Arts Association yeah. Yeah, in the last that. hundred years yeah. as an actual verifiably usable weapon, uh, sword, you know, uh, blade. Isn't that, is that correct? Yeah, that's what I, I heard. I got, yeah. that, I got, I got a letter. Isn't that amazing? It. Isn't that amazing? That's so, are you a weapons collector? Uh, I have a few. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I wanted to ask you, uh, what is there? A, uh, what happened when the, uh, is, there's a story that the art department tried to get you to uh, change the batlet design? Oh well, uh, when I, I sent over the drawings, the uh, uh, one came back made out of very thin plywood, and somebody decided to make it very asymmetrical, and uh, clearly they didn't understand why the design was such as it is uh, for ergonomic purposes. So I, I uh, had a rare moment of being upset and, mm -hmm. and, and showing it. And uh, so after that, they were very careful about mm -hmm. following things carefully. And other influences like uh, the uh, Jem'Hadar fighting cleavers, they came from uh, Tibetan fighting cleavers. And uh, so... What's a cleaver? Uh, it, well, it's kind of like a round thing with a little hook on the end and it's... Uh, used in pairs and uh it was in the one of the gem hadar episodes where some kid is mm. learning how to uh -huh. use him and uh so a, a good alien right 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 do you continue <laughs> to pick away at designing weapons for star uh, trek um uh, if they ask me if they ask you mm. yeah I, uh something else i did for picard uh, the production designer, the wonderful Dave Blass, uh, asked me if I would do some, uh, as if they were ancient uh, Klingon drawings of weapons uh, in an old manuscript. So I did that for them as a, as a favor. Now, you're a seven-time Emmy Award winner on the shows. Yeah, uh, I got you, robbed a few years. You were nominated. <laughs> <laughs> you got robbed. I was going to say, you were nominated at least a dozen times, weren't you? Nineteen. Nineteen times. Nineteen. Wow. Good Lord. Uh, do you remember the standout win that you really was like, yeah, that? Uh, the first one, and I think um, uh, uh, also uh, because it was our first Star Trek we did purely CG was the win for uh, the pilot of Enterprise. Right, right. And uh, it, because it marked a, a, a significant technological shift, yeah. but uh, what was important to everybody on the team, and it's, it's also important to say that um, there's no single hero of Star Trek visual effects, especially not me. Uh, I just got to work with a lot of really wonderful people who had an incredible... Uh, range of different skill sets that collectively not, not least that chap there ron <laughs> over your shoulder yeah that's a young ron moore by the way <laughs> in case you were as you were staring at him uh, recognize uh, without the glasses yeah, yeah. and uh, so yeah there were so many wonderful people that worked on it so i was just lucky to be in a in a leadership position mm -hmm. and uh but uh, uh and helping to to guide um, everything toward a common artistic goal and working with the, the other team members, Rob and Gary, and uh, later on other people came in. Um, and uh, so that was... Mm. Who led the team? Was it... Was it well, it was, it was a, a two-tiered. It was Rob and me. Mm. Right. Mm. right. And then, but then when we, uh, when Deep Space Nine came along, we split, split off and then I took over uh, next generation and Rob took over Deep Space Nine then he left so then I ran both of them and so then uh, I kind of uh, changed from supervisor to producer so I could get better parking um, <laughs> <laughs> it's well, significantly better yeah it really is what was an average day's work like 16 hours yeah. was it wow um uh, it would depend. Each day was different, which was kept it fun. Because some days I'd be on set with you guys. Uh, some days I got to direct second unit. You did, didn't you? Yes, that's right. You did quite a bit of second unit. Um, uh, I uh, 
some days I'd, we'd be shooting models at the motion control stage. Some days I'd be compositing. Some days I'd be working on a matte shot. Some days I'd be doing conceptual design. Um, I directed Birthright Part Two. That's right, you did. Right. And, uh, and yeah. another Michael, wonderful Michael Dorn performance. How was, how was, I mean, only one episode that you got to direct. What was that? Was it, you just did it and was like, okay, done that. Don't need to do that again. No, it was, uh, they were, they, there were a lot of reasons for it, uh, uh, but uh, partly that, but I liked the second unit, but also they didn't want me to be offline for three weeks. Right. right. So it was they birth, needed birth, your right. skills elsewhere. Right. And they didn't, right. So uh, did you did you ask to direct again? And they were like, "Yeah, Dan, we need you." Uh, I I hinted at it, but they they, they were they didn't pick it up. And I assumed yeah. they didn't like my work anyway. So it, right, yeah, Rick could be fussy like that. I know. I mean, my funny enough, Michael's but, a classic story for it. And I'm the only person who never got a um, uh, a tone meeting, so I had no idea what they really wanted, and then. Somebody was complaining, well, you didn't do this. Well, had you told me that, I would have thought more about it. Mm. All right. All right. Are you uh, still working on the new or Trek series? No. No? No, I, the last uh, Trek series I worked on was uh, with show. you guys. Right. Really? Yeah, Enterprise. Mm. Fools. Yeah, uh, really. I'm curious, as technolo technology advanced and as you had to adapt your skills and learn, did you find that fun or were you... Frustrated, or did you about both? Little, all of yeah. the above. Yeah, <laughs> uh, there were some things that were frustrating on it, but uh, uh, but even at the beginning, when I moved to Next Generation, I'd done all my previous work using optical printers and film technology. Mm. And one of the courageous decisions made by Paramount with Next Generation was that there would be no film negative as a final product. It would be. Um, uh, a video composite and we were working in one inch analog video at the time which okay. is very crude um and so it was fun uh and the, the shows got bigger and bigger and the so it would take say all day to shoot a simple flyby and it could take several days to shoot something more complicated or if there are several ships in the shot it could take a week uh, so we couldn't um when you get the uh a scene where they want 150 ships in the shot, uh, there's no way we could physically have done that with models. Mm. Mm. No, I guess not. Cool. I mean, and there's, you know, there's, I mean, there's just no way, is there? And CG got better and better too. And so. what was it? I mean, CG when we started our first season was still, it was, it wasn't rudimentary, but it was still pretty, you know. Uh, it was, it was enough to be able, and it was expensive too. I mean, I'm, I'm, I seem to be aware. Uh, no, no more than. Traditional than actually technology. doing model work and 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 but we could do more more stuff like bigger ships right. and and for example when we did Voyager the big news technologically was that the wings would go up when when Voyager would go to warp and the great model maker Tony Meininger had to find these uh, NASA little chains to put inside so that the right. motion control repetition would be perfect, and that was a big deal. And now with CG, you could have moving parts all right. over the place. And, well, you know, and we we had a, a unique situation on our show where we went from film to digital. Mm. That's right. And yeah. and what was that process like? The the crossover happening. Well, uh, Marvin uh, Rush, our director of photography. Uh, had to rethink uh, his lighting patterns a little bit because uh, the digital was so clear that we yeah. that he, uh, sometimes the prosthetic makeup would become more obvious yeah. or the costumes wouldn't quite have the feeling of verisimilitude we were looking for. It was that right. Sony red camera, wasn't it? Yeah, it was and very precise. So Marvin, um, Marvin. Uh, kind of adapted his style to the technology and right. did did a great job. And I was blessed I worked with Marvin on other projects after that. In many ways for our show, it worked a treat because we liked a lot of low lighting to give it that sort of submarine feel. Right. And that camera particularly was good in, in low lit situations. And, and one of the things we did with, with the ship shots, we did a lot of backlighting so that you'd see the, the key light would be coming from the back and the ship would be kind of rimlet. And the reason we did that is we understood that uh, the audience can imagine way better than we can show them. Yeah. So by keeping parts of the ship in mysterious shadows, mm. 
they would imagine, wow, that ship's really cool if only I could see it. Right, right. <laughs> That's interesting. Uh, I was wondering, you know, your influence on uh, your experience in um, Southeast Asia and coming back to the States, I mean, was there some culture shock? I mean, clearly the influence of your time there has been uh, important and vast. Lifelong. Lifelong. Yeah. And, um, you know, how have they blended for you? Well, I did have culture shock coming back. Um, Five years away, right? Yeah. Yeah, it's a long time. And Five uh, years, not never, no visit back? Just uh, no, a couple of visits back because my father was quite ill at the time. Uh -huh. Um, so I just come back for a, a week or two. And, and nevertheless, and, it's a long, long, long stretch. And uh, and a lot of the time, I was in areas where there was no electricity, no phone, mm -hmm. and I didn't realize how hard it was for my parents because I, there was no way I could communicate with them. And you know, once I became a parent myself, it was like, oh yeah, because th they would just spend months wondering what happened to me. Right, mm -hmm. right. And uh, but I I don't think you can. Um, Did you refuse to speak English? <laughs> uh, well, it, well, it, it, it's interesting. One of the things I learned about about language is stop translating, just use it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was an interesting quote I read that you said. You know, people should learn another language just to be able to think and formulate thoughts in in, in a different way. Yeah, yeah, and a language does that, yeah. especially the more <clears throat> different the language is from. A European language, the better the result of doing that right. is. Yeah, it's one of my regrets that I never really. I, I learned French pretty good as a seventeen-year-old, but it's all gone now. But I really, that's one regret I have that I've never spent a life speaking another language fluently. Agreed. So five years away, and you come home, and you're definitely a bit of a fish out of water. And uh, how long did it take you to sort of, you know, reacclimatize? Um. Well, I started working, <clears throat> doing the biomed illustration pretty mm. quickly from coming back. So when you're thrown into work, and uh, luckily there were some really interesting people there, and there was a, a, an older guy who taught me how to use an airbrush, which was new for me, and uh, I became proficient with that thanks to, thanks to him. Um, and I don't know that I ever really came back. All right. Yeah, that's my. That's kind of my question. Oh, that's yeah. It. yeah, yeah. I mean, I love did, that answer. Yeah. Did you? Um, were, was your art influenced by your stay? Oh, sure. I do, did a lot of art while I was there, um, and I seeing their art. At, especially Thailand is is filled with art everywhere, and a lot of it's very traditional, with kind of a naive, uh, almost uh, pre Renaissance sense of perspective. But the the elegance and grace and balance of their art and the way it, their art is reflective of their mythology and philosophy. Mm -hmm. uh, and I began to realize that <clears throat> an artist, at least from my perspective, needs to be an explorer, not a manufacturer. Right. And certain artists will hit on something that's popular and they just keep doing the same painting over and over again for 20 years. Right. Yeah. Where I... It I've, can be lucrative. <laughs> it, uh, way more than it has been for me. <laughs> but um, yeah. but I, I think uh, it, it, it's a journey. That's why I, I'm such a fan of, uh, of Pablo Picasso, because right. <clears throat> you look at his work and how it evolved, and he was always experimenting. And some, always. sometimes he would just do something a couple of times and then just abandon that, that mm -hmm. direction. And my favorite quote from an artist, which is probably incorrect <clears throat> is when I was a child they taught me how to paint like an adult when I became an adult I learned how to paint like a child and that's what Picasso did basically <clears throat> that's what he did yeah. and in 2019 I had uh, COVID and I spent three weeks recovering and during that time instead of just binging on old movies I I did maybe a hundred pieces of art oh. and I did them all as stream of consciousness yeah. where I didn't think about it. I had no, in, no, uh, no goal in mind. I just start with a few strokes and then just, um, uh, 
see where they led, and a lot of them became faces. A well, lot of them. Some beautiful stayed. pieces. Mark, our producer, sent some of us mm. uh, oh. last night. Some well, thank really you. gorgeous pieces. Dan. Yeah, you're a very talented man. Well, they're just in, inner explorations, and yeah, was know. that all done on a on a computer, as it were? No, they're all no. done by hand in all traditional media. Hand. No yeah. kidding. Wow. Pencil and because they look yeah, color pencil, right. uh, a couple of oils. Uh, a lot of pencil, a lot of pen and ink. We'll be sure to be <clears throat> highlighting those in the episode. And uh, speaking of design and art, you, uh, you've you made guitars. You're a player uh, as well as a designer of guitars. Yeah, I hardly call myself a player. I, I, I fumble. Well, so do I. You have the nails. <laughs> yeah, i got the nails. <laughs> He's got the Spanish. I want to read a quote uh, from you because I think it'll lead us rather succinctly into something I want to talk about. Um you need to be a renaissance person if you want to be a great filmmaker. If you want to create, uh, creatively contribute to our art form, you need to understand the history of where we evolved from. I think film is the most powerful art form that our species has evolved. With that power, I believe that uh, as storytellers, we have a responsibility to make a positive impact on our species and a society as a whole. The computer is the best paintbrush and typewriter, typewriter ever created. But technology does not give you a brain or ideas. That has to come from you. With the tools we have now, the only limit to what we can create is our own imagination. Now, that's true. Yeah, it is true. Now, obviously, the advent of, of, of uh, AI Chat makes this a bit moot. I mean, what do you feel about uh, uh, your it own imagination? It doesn't make it moot, I don't think. I don't it, think it, it makes, makes it more important. important. Yeah. It, it makes it more important. I agree. And uh, one of one of my good friends, Sid Dutton, who did a lot of matte paintings for us on Star Trek, one of the all-time greats, <clears throat> did an experiment with AI where he said, I, I'd like to see a an ancient Egyptian ruin in the desert as if done by a particular uh, obscure British artists from the 1800s and within five minutes it was painting even matching his breaststroke style um my daughter-in-law did an experiment in in london where she said i'd like to see an alien city as if painted by dan curry uh -huh. and in five <laughs> minutes there were uh four paintings that could have been my paintings wow well how That's do you feel funny. about that uh i feel like uh i spent a lot of time learning how to drip had a doodle, and <laughs> now I could just tell a computer to do it for me. Uh, I, I think uh, it's a good tool, as Sid Dutton said. Uh, it's a means of making the untalented uh, talented. Um, so uh, like all technology, it's, it's a, uh, a two-edged sword that mm. um, there are going to be wonderful things about it. For example, in, in the sciences, um, uh, AI, especially using quantum computers, um, which are incredibly fast, uh, can solve problems that would take 150 PhDs, 150 years to solve, yeah. where it can be done in minutes because of the rate at which calculations could occur. But I think there's always going to be value in stuff made by hand. And I think the imperfections of of what any human, even the, the greatest human artist, endeavor, uh, th right. there's always an imperfection and that keeps it in a way real mm. because it reminds us of our own mortal limitations. The mm. mistakes are the magic. The mistake, well, even um, I think it was the, the Zuni in, in uh, southwestern United States uh, would never fully complete something uh, uh, because they. Uh, felt once everything was perfect, the world would no longer need right. to exist. Mm -hmm. And in Japan, there's a uh, uh, th there's an aesthetic term that is the uh, the beauty of of the imperfection. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's th is that the technique where they 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 make pots and bowls and cups out of broken pieces? Uh, uh, it's just a general aesthetic uh, uh, term, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, embracing the imperfection. Well, my the my my feeling is is that. To your point that, you know, coming to the ch chat GPT and all the stuff that we're dealing with in our strike is that I don't care if you make an amalgamation or a combination of 100 different faces, actors and expressions and gestures that you would ever get the soul out of someone. Well, that's why live theater is so important, because in 
the beauty of film is we can go to an eye if we want to see a, a subtle gesture, mm -hmm. which you can't do in, in, in a Broadway theater. Uh, on the other hand, uh, the fact that there's a, a human being that has transported him or herself into a character and you're seeing that live and there's that special energy between you and 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 the performer, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, we're human beings and we need human contact to to remind ourselves that we're we're alive. That's why you know we define ourselves by memories. Right. 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 Well said. Right. Yeah, no kidding. You know, and I'm reminded of uh, a quote you said about, I mean, our, about Star Trek in general, that our stories and our characters uh, carry, carry the promise uh, of the capacity for the future, an enterprise that is much more than the sum of its parts, which I think it really just encapsulates what this whole thing's been about all these years. I think one of the 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 genius inspirations Gene had uh, that was in the original series and Next Generation, uh, I forget if the other series had it, where we would start off with Captain's Log, star date, such and such. Mm. And what made that little moment important is it made the audience feel like we're looking at the history of the future and that we what we are seeing has already happened mm. so that it, it's a real event that we're being reminded of we're going back over yeah. I, you know i never really wrapped that around my head that the star the captain's log is a is a is a throwback is a look back yeah it, it's know? it's it, he's relating something that already already happened right. and i think um subconsciously it it tells the audience you're looking at a true story. Right. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Would you work on Star Trek again? If I was asked. Yeah. Well, they'd be lucky to have you. Believe me. Well, I think I think they uh, feel that the uh, uh, the aged need to be put out to pasture. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, yeah. look out for that pasture, ladies and gentlemen. Yeah, I'm definitely <laughs> feeling that. Uh, should we go for some questions? Yeah, some fan questions. Sure. Yeah, let's do it. Come on, then. Evan Gissinger from Patreon asks, which practical effects have nearly taken one of your fingers? <laughs> practical effects have nearly, have you nearly taken lost a one finger? of your fingers. That was uh, a couple of questions were that, so I assumed there was a story out there. Uh, maybe it was some flamboyant uh, gesture while driving. <laughs> um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, well, one time I, I was working on uh, uh, on a project, and the tool I was using, I was putting a lot of pressure on to to grind something, broke, and my hand snapped, <coughs> and uh, hit a pair of open scissors and cut uh, this finger to the bone around there. And uh, that one, this <laughs> finger, uh, and uh, it uh, the hello uh, finger. It, that's a good. Uh, well, it's uh, uh, representing the IQ this one? of certain fingers. This one. <laughs> At any rate, uh, I thought I would lose uh, feeling on it, and my wife blessedly discovered uh, MSM, and I started taking that and gained ah. my sensitivity back. Otherwise, I've been taking MSM for. <clears throat> I don't know 20, what that is. 25, 30 years. It, it's a, a, a chemical that's Methyl part of cell construction. Oh. Uh, it's yeah. very yeah. good. Very good for uh, joints and uh, Joint. general yeah. and, aches and pains. And, and when I cut it and the doctor told me I, I probably wouldn't get feeling back, my son said, well, Dad, you always wanted to play slide guitar. Now it's here. <laughs> <laughs> Kids. <laughs> All right. A uh, cheese pizza kid from Instagram asks, "What is the most needlessly expensive special effect you created?" Wow, John Billingsley smile, <laughs> <laughs> without a doubt, completely that, unnecessary. Yeah, John could do it without the. <laughs> CG. Yeah, exactly. Um, uh, that's that's tough. Um, why don't we go uh, the other direction rather than needlessly expensive? Um, Let's go um, uh, ridiculously cheap. Okay. Mm -hmm. And uh, there is a film called Pure Luck starring uh, Danny Glover and Marty Short. And at the end of the movie of Pure Luck, um, there's a scene where uh, Marty and the his female lead are standing on the dock and the dock breaks and they start drifting away. And it looks like the end of a Chuck Norris movie with a helicopter shot pulling yeah. back. And the uh, uh, the editor, the great Billy Weber, who uh, did the original Top Gun, um, 
Which you also did the main titles yeah, for. I, I yeah. did, yeah. yeah. Um, uh, Billy called me up and said, hey, Dan, can you come look at this movie? The end's not testing well. So I watched it and I said, well, I think, why don't you have one more joke that the audience is in on, but they're not. And, and so I said, well, what can you do? And I said, well, how about if we make it look like they're going to go over a waterfall? Hmm. So I said, well, we have no money. I said, y you have a couple hundred bucks? And he goes, yeah, yeah, we can do that. So, <laughs> so I went over to Image but G. I don't go out for dinner tonight. <laughs> uh, went over to Image G where we were shooting the motion control and set up a table and measured the height of the table was 29 inches. So I could make that 60 feet if I shot at 350 frames a second. And uh, then I looked at a lot of stills of... <laughs> Yeah, you've lost us. <laughs> uh, Not me. <laughs> I'm still following. I, 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 and I looked a lot of stills of, of waterfalls, and it looked like a bunch of little do white dots. And for some reason, that made me think of 20 mule team borax. So I made a cliff out of... Uh, heavy-duty black aluminum foil, dusted it with some brown paint, put 10 pounds of 20 mule team borax on a piece of foam core, set the camera up, um, shot it at that uh, high frame rate, and then just started punching the foam core because waterfalls have a, a cycle. Surge, oh. yeah. And so uh, for 200 bucks, we did this <laughs> uh, massive scene of uh, this giant waterfall. And once the sound guys put the, this waterfall sound in it, <laughs> uh, you'd swear it was a real so, waterfall. Wow. Movie magic. Wow. wow. That's amazing. Impressive. Was that the, the horse racing movie that uh, they did? Was it, was it, they were, they were gamblers? They were. No, no they were in the jungle somewhere. Oh, they were. Uh, Different movie. And My half brother, Marty Short. Yeah. I had a dollar for every time I used to go. Oh, <laughs> but uh, yeah, that was uh, so. Uh, that was fun coming up with uh, like medieval alchemy to yeah. The despair was the mother of invention. You know how we're right. going to make right. this look. We, right. we, we have no money and no resources. Has that happened often? Yes. Yeah. Especially in the early days of Star Trek. Yeah, oh, cool. shampoo bottles and the like. Yeah. And one time we had to do a uh, a rift in the time space continuum, so I took a bunch of big um, uh, cardboard tubes draped them with black velvet, uh, put lights uh, so they were ki kind of like a long horizontal funnel, put lights and vacuum cleaners underneath, and the vacuum cleaners would suck liquid nitrogen, was, which was in gutters, that would dribble down, and by lighting it and having the lights underneath, it looked like this fantastic uh, uh, rift coming through when you saw it happening in a star field. Wow. You're MacGyver. Oh. You're MacGyvering things. <laughs> You're currying things. MacGyvering so special cool. effects. Yeah, no, MacGyver's currying. Right, exactly. Yeah. All right. Uh, Michelle Ariola Palmer from Facebook asks, what surprises you most about how special effects have evolved with technology? The, the utter lack of limitations surprises me. Um, as we were talking earlier, if you can imagine it, you can make it happen. With in, in, like water simulation, water used to be uh, very difficult mm. to do. If you look at the old Ben Hur, you could always tell the ships were miniatures oh, yeah. because of right. the scale of the waves. And uh, but now with uh, with water simulation and the lighting uh, capabilities and the tracking capabilities, um, it's just that uh, the genius of of the people who have created the technology that is in use today basically has removed all limitations whatsoever, and we can do whatever we can imagine. Is that a constant so, learning process for you? Yeah, yeah, you have to keep and, up with. Yeah, and I, there's no way I can keep up. Right, uh, right. The uh, ossification of my cerebral tissue has prevented me from <laughs> keeping completely. But you can say, I've got an idea, and someone goes, I can do that. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, all right. Oh. Okay, so Vicki Wynn from Patreon asks you, for the next generation interested in special effects, what educational programs should they pursue? Oh, that's a really great question. Uh, you should certainly uh, study as much as you can about computing and uh, computing power, but uh, be aware that uh, by the time you graduate, it will probably be obsolete and there'll be something new on it. <laughs> so uh, developing the skill to continually learn, but also I would strongly encourage you uh, to study traditional media. Mm. And I find uh, that um, the ability to draw has solved so many problems on set because if you 
I, I remember a lot of times, with, right. especially with Scott Bakula, I'd sketch something out for him, say, hey, take a look, this, this is what it's going to be. Right. And that would h help the cast so much yeah. uh, because they, they would have a sense of it. So mm -hmm. traditional media should never be uh, ignored. And as we were talking earlier, take a, a course, do, get involved with at least one live theater production mm -hmm. during the course of your education and learn film history. And remember, uh, film and TV are uh, the embodiment of every other art form together. It, it, dance, photography, uh, painting with light, uh, set design, sculpture, acting, writing. So you need to understand all those things if you want to uh, be successful and have a leadership position. A good way to think about it is would you rather be um, Ralph Lauren or Tommy Hilfiger or the person operating the sewing machine. Mm. Yeah. And if you only study the computer, uh, you better be prepared to spend your career with Star Wars action figures glued on your monitor and sitting in a cubbyhole. But if you want to have uh, a uh, the ability to really contribute to the art form, know where we came from, uh, study the history of theater, uh, look at old films. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And Great see how answer. they were done. Did yeah. he say Star Wars, by the way? Yeah. I did say Star Wars. I, think you did. <laughs> I, I also, I also think that you know, if you're you going to live a, a life in art as an artist, uh, everything that you do, that that door is always just open to any experience that you have. And I'm, I mean, you know, I, I, as an actor, I can speak solely from that. Is that I'm, I'm mining information all the time um, at, at any given circumstance I'm in. I don't even consciously think like, oh, well, that's a good one to think about. It's just the, 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 the openness to, to all of it that, that sort of fills your vessel with the opportunity to express yourself. Yeah, well, I, I think you put it correctly that your life is your reference for your career. It yes. is. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, at KSE8348 uh, from YouTube asks, I really want to ask what was the simplest effect that had the biggest presence on screen? So. Well, we've answered that. Yeah, we've answered that. Yeah. Well, did Thank we? you for your question. I mean, have we? Um, <laughs> Something well, more simple? Well, story, surely. Was that a, <laughs> that, was, well, it doesn't sound like it was that, like it yeah. was that simple, frankly. Maybe there's a simpler one. Maybe cheaper. Maybe it's been uh, well, cheap. Uh, our, uh, unrelated to Star Trek, I was working on Chuck. Oh, um, uh, yes. Uh, where Scott Bakula was Chuck's father. And... Uh, and there's a scene where uh, somebody takes Talk off glasses. Got a part and, on that show, except for me. And, <laughs> and there's Even a fucking uh, Scott. <laughs> and there's a microcomputer built into the arm of the glasses. And the, my colleague working with me said, "Well, it'll take me three days to do the particle animation because the computer self-destructs and puffs of smoke come up." And I remembered my father used to amuse my brother and I. Uh, as children by pulling the cellophane off a cigarette package, burning a hole in it, blow smoke in it, and tap it, little smoke rings come mm -hmm. up. Right. So I found somebody who smoked, uh, took the plastic box that push pins come in, um, burned a hole in it, have it filled up with smoke, taped a piece of black velvet on the wall, cross-lit it with desk lamps, taped my iPhone to a chair, and shot it. And in 20 minutes, I had a better effect than we would have been able to do with ah. Look at you, mate. <laughs> wow. So Look at that. Oh my God. And wow. then he scuppered by 20 minutes because he doesn't smoke. Yeah. <laughs> and that was $1.38. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, Mark from the Shuttle Pod Show. Yay. He has a question for you. <laughs> of all the things you have learned and mastered, why is knife fighting the most rad? <laughs> uh, well, it's not necessarily, but it's very. <laughs> I knew we might say that. <laughs> it, it's it's very poetic because it's up close and personal, mm. um, unless you throw it um, <laughs> and run. <laughs> and, and I still do ten throws a day. Um, oh. So you can bring a gun to a knife fight. Uh, or you, or well, you, your knife, uh, when you throw it, you don't need a gun. Well, it depends on how fast you are. Oh, um, it, it's just, it's, there's a poetry to it. It goes back to ancient times. Uh, but I think uh, em empty hands is probably uh, equally poetic. And, uh, and knowing that you don't have to hit your opponent so hard, you just have to hit him in the right place. Mm. Wow. Wherever that might be. Words to live by. <laughs> I've always been interested in martial arts, but I haven't done it yet. Where, where should I start? 
It depends on on what you're interested in. Uh, there's two general schools of martial art, the external and internal. And the internal is typified by Aikido or Tai Chi, where it's very soft and you practice soft. And when you strike somebody, it's not a smack like this. It's a touch and then sending the power mm. internally. Um, then uh, karate, taekwondo, those are ex hungar, those are external martial arts. And they're all good. There's yeah. no better martial no art right than any other. Start. It's, it's yeah. what works for you. So um, uh, if you are interested in having a, uh, uh, going to a class, uh, go to a class, make sure there's no blood on the floor. Okay. And, uh, yeah. <laughs> and you'll be comfortable there. Or okay. knives in the wall. Yeah. And I knives in the wall are okay. <laughs> You practice Tai Chi every day still? Yeah. That's a lovely thing. How long do you practice for? It takes, uh, I do the short form, uh, and it takes about 20 minutes. Oh, yeah, I remember the gathering in and the pushing away. And Well, uh, in Next Generation, there were times when you'd see Worf teaching yeah. a class. Mm -hmm. Well, I would actually be behind the camera. Uh, <laughs> Showing in oh, the, really? Doing the motion. So oh, that, lovely. So wow. Cool. That's awesome. <laughs> Um, well, that's all the questions for today, right? Yeah. Uh, so I think uh, we're going to take this opportunity before we go into trivia uh, to thank uh, everyone from STLV who helped us. Yes. Yeah. Uh, we had uh, a lot of volunteers, and we, we need to thank the following Patreon and Discord volunteers specifically, um, or, or our self-designated wash gang uh, for all of the help and the hard work in setting up and running our booth and in doing all of the things that needed to get done to make sure that our time at STLV, the convention in Las Vegas this last weekend, uh, was as successful as it was, uh, and it, it was very successful Which for it us. was. Yeah. Uh, we, not, we need to thank uh, Ange, uh, Stephanie, Tiffany, Alan, Matthew, uh, Melissa, Mars, Catherine, uh, Sarah, and as always, Nina and Kelly, who were unable to attend but uh, helped from afar. So thank you all. Uh, if I missed anyone, I am very, very sorry. Did we're, you mention Lee? Yeah, I was uh, just going to say. Well, Lee. we're not there yet. <laughs> oh. uh, and also a very, very special thanks um, goes out to Lee Nickel, uh, to Ed Milner, oh, no. and to Sean Coleman. Thank you. Um, the three of you made it possible for us to attend. Yeah. Uh, and it was, a, it was a great thing that we did. So Yeah, so. we're blessed to have you all. So yeah. Truly. Helpful. Thank yeah. you Truly. very much. Yeah. Uh, and then one last uh, bit of uh, housekeeping. We would like uh, uh, all of us here at the Shuttlepod Show, um, Dominic, Connor, Erica, myself, everyone here, uh, we'd like to send out a get well soon to Kelly Harper. Uh, you're in, our, you're in our, our thoughts. Get well soon, Kelly. Get well soon, Kelly. Cool. Now we can go on to trivia. All right. All right. Did you want to thank the Salty Nerd? Oh, and thank you, the Salty Nerd uh, Nerds podcasters. Uh, 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 yeah, thank you guys yeah, so much. They were, you guys were a lot of help. Yeah. It was so seamless and so great to be live there. Yeah, it was. Yeah. Made it so in, yeah. Cool. And not as salty as I thought it was going to be. <laughs> <laughs> it's time for some Star Trek trivia. It's the three of you against producer Mark. Mark, 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 Mark. Oh, you should bring out the triple. Oh. <laughs> Uh, is they, it a mark, at, mark, at the, mark? At the convention, uh, Tiff, uh, one of our Patreon members, made like two a peas in a pod. You couldn't uh, tell them apart, right? Really. And it actually says mark, 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 mark. Mark, mark, mark. You can hear mark, it, mark. but you can't. Uh, it was very surprising. I, I, I didn't like it at first. <laughs> <laughs> but now he sleeps. With but it. you like it now. <laughs> uh, Anyways. Mark, 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 mark. Um, <laughs> <laughs> okay. Today, uh, Dan, Dominic, and Connor are playing for our Patreon member. Angie Bishop. Well, Mark is playing for our newest member. Oh, let me look who our newest member is. Na, 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 na. Stephen Fine. Stephen Fine. Our, br okay. our brand newest member. <laughs> Here we member. go, Angie. This is for you. Little car. All right. Question number one. In Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, Sulu is captain of what starship? A, the Yorkshire, B, the Yorktown, C, the Yamato, or D, the Excelsior? Ah, uh, what well, do we wait, think? Not, it, it can't be the Yorktown, can it? That's already been one. I think it's the Yamato. The Yamato? That sounds like it would be plausible, doesn't it? Was that C? Well, si since it's Sulu. Final answer. Wait a minute. Yeah. <laughs> you fucking, uh, just, you kill me. Uh, was C, Yama, you're the Yama, what's it? Yamato. Uh, the Yamato. 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 He's not looking like it is. It isn't. <laughs> Mark, Mark, Mark. The Excelsior. 
Woo! All right. Ah, uh, nuts. All right. Question number two. Question number two. Spock bested the Kobayashi Maru test how? A, by reprogramming the simulator. B, by incorporating a cloaking device. C, through negotiations. Or D, he never took the test. Mark, mark, mark. Oh, I got it. So. I don't have any idea. <sighs> uh, what was the first one? A, by reprogramming the simulator. B, by incorporating a cloaking device. C, through negotiations. Or D, he never took I the test. I think number one, the simulator. Damn. Mark, 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 mark. Uh, he never took the test. Ah, uh, boo. Ding, ding. <laughs> he won. I can also, for a bonus point, if that's allowed, I can say how Kirk won. Kirk won by reprogramming the simulation. Oh, really? Yes. <laughs> so that he could win. Okay. Question number three. The Kardashev scale is a method of measuring a civilization's level of te technological advancement based on the amount of energy it is able to use. Which of these advanced technologies encountered in the next generation would represent a type two civilization on their Kardashev scale? Mark, 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 mark. <laughs> well, <hang on. laughs> a, the Dyson Sphere, B, artificial intelligence, C, the Borg Collective, or D, artificial wormholes? Yes, mark, yes, I got it. Uh, the uh, Dyson Sphere. Oh, crap. I actually us. knew that. Aww. You knew that I, I knew that one too, actually. Did you? No, 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 <laughs> no, no, I didn't. No, I didn't. No, I didn't. <laughs> Three right. zip. Oh, well, we're getting we should, crushed. We should Sorry, Angie. <laughs> Question number four. In the Enterprise episode in A Mirror Darkly Part One, mm. what is the name of the device Dr. Phlox and Lieutenant Reed create and use on a telewrite? A, a disintegrator. B, an agony booth. C, a matter antimatter discriminator. Or D, all of the above. I want to know what an agony booth is. Uh, <laughs> did we? I don't know that we call it an agony booth. But I'm tempted to go with all of the above because certainly the first two, the disintegrator and the, what was the other one? A uh, disintegrator, an agony booth, a matter, antimatter, discriminator, or all of the above. All right. Let's go with all of the above. <laughs> Shut the fucking front door. <laughs> okay, uh, this is kind of a guess. So I'm going to say the agony booth. Yeah. Oh. Because yeah. oh, it, it appeared it. in the original series, but I guess, you know, we got it could have been week. invented. So, yeah. Yeah. Right. One more for the heck of it. Yeah, All one right. more for fun. Question number five. In the DS9 episode, For the Uniform, what famous Earth novel does Lieutenant Michael Eddington send Captain Sisko? A, War of the Worlds, B, To Kill a Mockingbird, C, Les Mis Rob, or D, The Catcher in the Rye? Mark, yes, uh, Les Mis. All right, five zip. We well, that was fun. Kill. Sorry, Angie. Uh, that an oh, embarrassment. Well. Not yeah. a one this wow. year, this week. That was right. a clean sweep. I think that may have been the first. I think I so. I think it is. Uh, I want to then uh, congratulate Stephen Fine. Uh, you uh, won trivia thanks to uh, our team up here, not knowing any of the answers. Uh, <laughs> so wow. and thank you for being our very, very uh, brand newest, shiniest uh, Patreon member, Stephen thank Fine. You. Thank you. Thank you. Winner, winner, chicken dinner. Yay. <laughs> and now it's time for Stuck on an Island with Connor Trenier. A deserted island. So, you're on a deserted island for the rest of your life. It gets better. <laughs> you are given the works of Shakespeare and whatever religious book you'd like. Those are there. You select your cuisine. For instance, if you check, check, uh, pick Italian, it's all Italian food. Um, your dessert you like cookies, you get all the cookies. Musician, composer, and author. And then you get a bonus item. The bonus item, however, cannot get you off the island. The bonus item cannot get you off the item. Yeah. It's more of a luxury. It's more of a luxury item. Yeah, yeah I think we're going to add the caveat that the bonus item can only be something, you can only get it if Amazon or Target will deliver it. <laughs> Are they sponsoring us? Uh, no. <laughs> so uh, your author for the rest of your life on a deserted island. You're not unhappy, by the way. There. Um, possibly uh, Thomas Costain. Ooh, I, I don't, don't know, know who that is. Um, he wrote a lot of... Um, uh, novels that were kind of um, 
medieval adventures. Uh, several of them have been made into movies, including my favorite Orson Welles performance, Prince of Foxes, where oh. Orson oh. Welles was oh. Cesar de Borgia. Oh. Right. And nice. uh, uh, the other one was, uh, another good one, was Tyrone Power in uh, The Black Rose. All right. All right. All right. And uh, so uh, I... Thomas Chast Chastain. Chastain, right. Okay. Out of curiosity, your top three movies. In no particular order. I was thinking about throwing a movie section into the island with you, if you were... Uh, the first half of Spartacus. Yeah. The first half of Spartacus. And... <laughs> then it falls apart. <laughs> it, it, yeah, once they escape, it becomes a different movie. Yeah. Um, and... Um, Possibly um, the the mortal storm. Oh, I don't know that. Uh, MGM uh, 1930s, made just prior to World War II. Uh, James Stewart, um, and it's a set in a uh, Bavarian mountain town, and it's uh, at. Opens with Frank Morgan, the Wizard of Oz, as a beloved professor who's it's his birthday. And there's a birthday dinner, and over the radio they announced that Hitler's just been uh, nominated for um, or just been elected chancellor, and then suddenly their whole society starts to break apart, and it's so relevant to what we're going through today. Right. Say it again, the name? The, the Mortal title. Storm. The Mortal Storm. Storm. One more. Wow, I've got to see that movie. Um Uh, Forbidden Planet, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, uh, a Chinese film, The Blade Spares No One. <laughs> Shocking. <laughs> <laughs> All right, back to the game. Uh, your cuisine. <laughs> Thai. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah. Close. Um, your musician slash composer. You get all of their work. Uh, have to be, uh, have to be the Beatles. Yes. Yeah. He's a Beatles man. Yeah. Um, and then your dessert. The dessert would have to be, and you'd have to eat the same dessert every day. No, but if you select uh, cobbler, you get all the flavors of cobbler or all the ice creams or all the cookies. I see. Um, apple pie. All oh. right. You can get. You can, you you can, can just say pie. Middle. You get all the oh, pies. Okay, pie. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm trying to help you out on your island. Uh, and then your bonus slash luxury slash survival item. I'll give you a little clue. Uh, James Darren selected a Ferrari. <laughs> <laughs> I, was, I was thinking as a uh, uh, a personal submersible. Yeah, yes. <laughs> that gets you off fight. the island. It gets you off the island. Oh yeah, okay. I don't know if Target will deliver that. <laughs> right. There's uh, a sale on them right now, by the way. <laughs> Shoot. There's the, a thought. I mean, I should go with surfboard, really. Yeah, that's good break. Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah, you well, then the you can get you off the <laughs> island too. <laughs> You're never gonna make it, man. <laughs> <laughs> Let's face it. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Uh, a perfect acoustic guitar. There, oh, there you go. There you go. Yeah, because the thing is, it's like, you know, an archipelago. We, oh, we can all see each other. Mm. Oh, we can? Yeah. Are yeah. oh, we waving? Hey, what are you doing? How's your yeah. ice cream? Put your swimming trunks on. <laughs> <laughs> it's too close. You're going to get burned. <laughs> <laughs> okay, that's great. Um, yeah, I'd come to your island. Yeah. Bring Thank my guitar. You, we could, uh, yeah, truly, uh, it's extraordinary to have you here. Um, a, a man who has lived... Um, gosh, it seems like many lives and uh, and a life in and art. And now we're going to kill you. <laughs> <laughs> I was just going to say, a great Patreon oh, special. He's, he's reaching straight for the Macklin. Yeah, exactly. Oh, oh, this, you know what, this, Dom? This is not going to go well for you. This is not going to go well for me. We, we should do that. A great Patreon special <laughs> idea would be for Connor and Dominic and Erica to uh, Have a to fight, fight to the death. To the death with Dan. I'd rather just I do don't a, think we would come out of that room. Do a tai Chi yeah, lesson with him. I think so. It's just, we're going nice to skip with a Tai Chi lesson. Nice. Yeah, there's nothing like reaching out to the rib cage and squeezing the spleen. Oh, Lord. <laughs> wow. Uh, right? Where are you at Didn't know you could do that. I didn't know that was legal. He's a smooth-talking <laughs> bastard, isn't he? 
Uh, we got a lovely bottle of wine for you, I believe. Yes, we have a lovely, oh. lovely wine for you. Oh, it's a you. Syrah. It's from our Patreon member, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah from Sean. From Sean, thank you, Sean. Thank you, Sean. Uh, vineyard? Yes. Oh, thank you so much. Yeah. Alamitos Vineyards. Can't wait to see you. Thank you, thank okay. you, thank you. Thank Dan, you what, so a, much, what a wonderful... Dan. Thank you for coming thank to sit oh, in the well, Golden Throne with us. Yeah, thank you for bringing the toys. These are just phenomenal. Call them what you will, Dominic. Those are dumb <laughs> weapons. <laughs> well, they're not sharp, toy. though. Yeah. But these are the originals, huh? Yeah. Yeah. So cool. I didn't want to say anything, but I think I'm bleeding out from sitting there. <laughs> this well, it's been an absolute joy, mate. Thanks. Yeah. Thank, thank you, you so thank much. You, Dan. Yeah. Thank you, Dan. Thank you. I appreciate it, and I hope you find 15 seconds of usable material. Oh. Oh. No, one we're we're, we're going to mine this for all it's worth. Seconds. And for those of you that loved what he had to say, check out the artistry of Dan Curry. Yeah. So yeah. I'm going to pull that yeah. up again. Fascinating book. It really is. Nice. Uh, yes, and, and also a reminder, uh, please like and subscribe to our show. Uh, and if you can, you should join us on Patreon. All the details are below. Uh, we have merch. We have a website, shellpodshow.com, uh, with ways to contribute to the sustainability. And show. since that is deliverable by Amazon, you can have it on all of your deserted islands. There you go. Yeah. Oh, there uh, you go. Great. Thank you awesome. so much, Thank Dan. You. Thank cool you. Label. Yeah. Yeah. Like, subscribe, and join us on Patreon.